Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Boozer. I'm with CGC HQ, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's Connect webinar with uh, Citrix. We're gonna be talking about remote access and uh, bringing your remote access solution into the future. Um, but before we get into our main presentation today, I want to introduce who all's on our call with us. We have Gabe Correjo, he is a Senior Program Manager at Citrix. Monica Grismers, she is a product marketing specialist. Jake Gretzky, senior product marketing manager, and you've probably seen him around at some CUGC XL events around the country. And Joshua Sunquist, he's the director of workspace and uh, all of my screen, sorry, workspace and platform architecture. Um, as we get into this presentation, um, each of these guys will be taking a turn presenting, and we'd love to have you type in your questions in the question panel. Um, we will hold all of the questions until the end, but we do want you to type those questions in as you have them so that uh, you, you can remember what you're asking about and, and we know that they'll come up throughout the presentation, but um, to keep things flowing, we'll hold them all to the end. And uh, one other final note, our presentation is being recorded today, so you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording in case you need to go back and revisit things. So with that, I'm going to turn things over. I think, uh, Gabe, am I handing things over to you first? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, what, one quick housekeeping note, uh, my Twitter account is at CitrixGabe. I think the at Gabe Correjo is taken by some gentleman out in uh, San Jose. So oh, no. <laughs> if you need to tweet at me, it's Citrix, it's Citrix Gabe. No, no worries at all. All right. I'll so put that thank in the so chat much, for everyone. everybody. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody. So we're, we're here to chat, and I'm so happy to um, have co-presenters on this topic. Um, you know, who, who those are the really the, the subject matter ex experts that you're really here to listen to. And we're here to discuss how you can increase your user productivity and revolutionize that traditional remote access solution you may have today uh, with, you know, Citrix technologies. And I'm going to start off with uh, sharing our agenda today. Um, and, and my section is introduction and overview to give you kind of the background. Uh, Jake Rupski is going to then chat with you about, you know, how there can be a fragmented story uh, with other solutions. And then uh, Joshua Sunquist will come in and talk about our real-world deployment example, you know, the, tr the true meat, uh, meat of this uh, webinar where, you know, he'll talk about going from zero to 140,000 uh, deployed users with remote PC access. And then Monica will come in and chat about, you know, how you're not leaving this uh, behind to one use case, but you're utilizing the value of the license to expand and bring in the future into the, to your workspace. And then la lastly, I'll have some wrap-up and key takeaways to kind of remind you um, uh, what you uh, heard about today from a story perspective, and then we'll have Q&A. So with that, I'll get started. Um, and, and so conjecturally, you can talk about how companies have allowed since mm, mid-90s, 1990s, uh, remote access to PCs. Um, and they started out way back, if you, you can recall, uh, you know, dialing up uh, using a, an RAS server with PC Anywhere, you know, and utilizing those kinds of systems, which then gravitated into utilizing maybe some, uh, the baked-in technology. But why did they do this? Why do IT admins and corporations allow remote access to PCs? And it's very simple. There's, you know, um, business challenges that occur seasonally, like in the Northeast, you know, these huge you know, winter events, you know, Snowmageddon, you know, you see that Twitter handle all the time, right? Um, you want to allow a more um, um, malleable or work shifting teleworking uh, workplace so that your your employees can have a great work life balance. Um, you know, and then everybody's heard of VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure. You may have a PC refresh moment at some point and you know you're either turning to VDI or you're considering it, or maybe you, you've decided that VDI is not for you, but you still have that business challenge of providing, you know, secure, fantastic experience to those uh, desktop and lap and laptop. So, um, some folks think the PC, the business PC, is dead. I tend to disagree, um, and uh, you know. 
so do so does Gartner and you know some of the other uh, industry um, analysts tracking the shipment of business PCs. In fact, PCs grew last year and into this uh, Q1. They grew quarter after quarter for the first time uh, in in many years, um, and that uh, growth is driven by you know Windows 10. Um, and you may find uh, a um, uh, a specific Gartner uh, report where it talks about well it declined in Q4. Well, it declined because there was a shortage of CPUs, not actually a, a market uh, dip. So there's still quite a bit of um, uh, investment uh, in business PCs and laptops uh, within corporations. So how did they uh, how did they allow remote access to PCs today? The, the, if you take a look at the, the broad swath of the market, um, you know typically there's going to be within uh, a company or a small business that has less than 500 users, they may not have an IT representative. So they may search for something that's cloud-based, that's very self-service and unmanaged, if you will. But if they have, you know, branch offices, uh, a medium business or large enterprise. Typically, what they've done is they've purchased these point appliances uh, to allow SSL VPN connectivity and then launch an RDP session or some sort of maybe VNC session as well. But those are highly managed and they can be fragmented, so the user experience can be uh, poor or it can be, um, you know, you know, unmanaged where it, it's really kind of a free-for-all. The users load up a VPN and they launch a you know, an application and they have to remember their machine name or IP address and then they have to authenticate multiple times. So that can be kind of a fragmented solution and Jacob will talk a little bit more in, in depth there. What we've seen primarily is if you're a Citrix uh, admin or um, a virtual apps deployment, you'll publish an application, whether that's the, the remote desktop application or VNC or some other sort of remote application, you'll present that to a group of users or all users through the through Active Directory, and then you'll you'll connect with um, you know what was known as receiver now workspace app through uh, uh, the, the the gateway uh, that might be um, on prem or in a branch office etc. Now with the cloud it can be through the cloud, but that's a HDX protocol session which then gets lost end to end connectivity because you're using the other protocol from the uh, published application server. So you'll see I, in quotes here, I have you know Zen App Presentation Server. That's historically you know what is in customers' deployments from a, um, a product name. But when you look at it, you lose a lot of that you know protocol security, single sign-on, and analytics because you're transitioning from one protocol to another. So um, the most broad um, deployment, as I shared in the previous slide, is you know, kind of loading up um, RDP you know, through a VPN tunnel. And so, you know, while that's great, you lose some of the benefits of the protocol that, you know, Citrix has, you know, been well known for, for, you know, 30 plus years. And, you know, when it comes down to being able to provide uh, a seamless, um, smart, and um, transition experience between any device and any connection, that's where we can add a lot of value and provide a seamless experience where you may have a fragmented experience today. So with that, I wanted to transition over to Jacob and he can talk a little bit more you know, about this fragmented story between RDP, VPNs, um, and what you may or may not uh, own. So Jacob, I'm gonna transition over to you. All right, Gabe, thank you very much. Hopefully uh, you can hear me all right. We sure can, thank you. Perfect, and then now hopefully everyone can see my screen. So my area of focus, right, is, is of course networking. Hopefully everyone knows that. If you don't, well, you do now. Um, so my area of focus is, is all of our networking products, ADC, SD-WAN, et cetera. So VPN is, it's a networking technology and it's been around for a really long time. And the whole idea was, well, as people move outside and start working remotely, we can give them some sort of security because apps did not exist. SaaS apps did not exist. Um, and, you know, they didn't always exist. So we needed a way to secure remote access. And the first technology to kind of try to do that was a VPN. Now, I'm not picking on any specific vendors here. These are just some common uh, 
some common ones out there. Obviously, our ADC provides its own SSL VPN. Um, but from a user perspective, when you think about it, it's a little kludgy. Uh, it, you have to log in, uh, and then there's this little thing, you know, that runs down on the tray, and you have to make sure you're connected. And if it gets disconnected, or you know, maybe there's some issue and you get disconnected throughout the day, that might disrupt, you know, what's what you're trying to do and doing your work and getting things done. So if we dive a little bit deeper and look at what what is VPN? I mean, what what's the whole point? The idea here is on the right side, you've got your resources. Now those are data, those are servers, applications, web services, files, any number of different things. I don't care where they live, right? It might be in public cloud, might be on-prem, some, you know, some co-location facility, anywhere, and you're putting them in some sort of, you know, perimeter of security. Usually that's a firewall. So I'm abstracting that as much as I can. Now, the idea of remote access, that's that guy over there on the left. And obviously there is some sort of you know, remote connection. Now, when you bring a VPN into play, what you're effectively doing is you're extending that tunnel into uh, the, the user there. So when that happens, let me see if I can mute my phone here. I do apologize, everybody. Uh, when you when you extend that network onto uh, the user, you're effectively bringing that secure network to the user. So if their laptop is untrusted, well, you, you kind of need to be concerned about that. Even if you are, you know, maybe it's a corporate laptop, you know, who knows what happens in between when, you know, I forgot to connect or maybe my son took it to school or doing some schoolwork there's gonna be some, some potential for issues there. So we need to think about a couple of things. We need to think about a connection policy. When they connect, am I going to allow access to only these certain servers or only these certain resources? Also, what am I gonna do with all of the other traffic? Am I going to backhaul that you know, SaaS app traffic? Am I going to split tunnel it? And that's a whole other security concern there. So there's a lot of things you really need to think about when you are talking about VPNs. And again, what happens if that if that system is compromised or you know has some malware or, or something on it, where you're, are you really going to trust that they you know are going to connect up to your VPN tunnel? So we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in just a minute. But I want to talk about the applications too and the user experience. So from a network perspective, let's say that everywhere inside our trusted resource zone maybe we have somewhere below you know two milliseconds of latency that's totally acceptable um, applications are fine it doesn't matter um, i don't see any issues things like that um, but outside of that trusted network uh, if i go to you know starbucks or i'm coming in from home maybe i have a latency of somewhere around 30 milliseconds maybe higher maybe a little lower but when I'm working on applications, if I'm just connected to a VPN, my round trip time to that application is somewhere around 62 milliseconds, right? Give or take, you know, 30, 32 milliseconds each way. Now that's not too bad, but what happens if I'm somewhere else, right? And all of a sudden my latency bumps up to 60 milliseconds. Well, now all that, you know, database traffic or application traffic, that now has to go about 120 milliseconds of round trip time. So that's always been the problem with VPNs because it just means that user experience just isn't that great because again, SaaS applications did not always exist and the apps on-prem just, they were never built for highly latent networks. Now, if only we had some sort of protocol that we could use to present a remote desktop but wait, there's more, <laughs> right? So that's where RDP comes in. Now, I'm gonna caveat all of that with a few things to remember. RDP is built into Windows, period. So it's pretty set in concrete as to what RDP client you have when you are on, you know, let's say Windows 7 or Windows 8 or 10, 
and what RDP server version is on 2008, 2012, 16, 19, et cetera. So those are pretty set in stone. Obviously there is a little bit of play. Uh, you can't upgrade a little bit, but it's built in. And that's another key because if something is built into Windows, that means it's always gonna be there. And that attack surface is, that, that just opens the door. So there was a recent vulnerability where Microsoft basically um, said that you uh, should be really be concerned because there is a way for users to, unauthent unauthenticated users to attack your system via uh, vulnerability in RDP. Uh, now that's, that's pretty significant. It was significant enough that Windows XP, which is no longer supported unless you have an extended support contract. And I don't even know if those are still around. I'm sure they are. But Microsoft even released a patch for Windows XP for this vulnerability, right? So that should kind of tell you how big of a deal this was. This isn't the only one, unfortunately. Um, now there was a vulnerability, and Microsoft obviously is very good about patching vulnerabilities. But what's unique about this is that it would prevent connections uh, in the event of a, a version mismatch. So for example, if you had on your laptop, you know, you keep up to date with Windows Update and you update very frequently, if you update your RDP client via Windows Update, but the machine that you're connecting to isn't, well then all of a sudden you get this wonderful error you see here on the screen and you can't, you can't log in. Uh, same goes for if your server gets updated and your client is not, et cetera. And this was a, a really good thing for Microsoft to do because it allowed them to kind of mitigate this issue where if, if one of those, uh, if the client or the server was up to date, then, hey, I'm going to make sure that I prevent um, this connection from happening because it's potentially vulnerable. So what are the common ways that RDP is deployed? Let's just hope that this doesn't happen anymore. And I hope everybody on this uh, webinar goes and checks and makes sure, uh, makes sure that 3389 is not open through their firewall period ever. Uh, because if it is, please, please, please stop. Um, stop that right now. Um, so in that case, right, um, what do we do when we need to add some additional security? Well, one of the things that we can usually do is we can potentially add another form of authentication, right? We can add a multi-factor auth. So whether that's a software token or hardware token or a, you know, a call me or text me, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately for RDP, even though this looks really cool, it doesn't actually exist, right? Because without um, Azure AD and some of the, the, the new features and capabilities with uh, WVD and Azure AD, this enhanced RDP just isn't possible, right? You can't have multi-factor authentication. So you can't secure it that way. There's some other things that you need to think about when you're using just pure RDP. Uh, and one of those things is what happens when those, those machines on the back end, if they, what if they're you know, set to go to sleep well, what if they're turned off? I mean, if these are you know workstations, there there is a, a good possibility that they could be set to turn off. So that's something that you something else that you have to worry about. And if if I'm a remote worker, I'm a road warrior. I just want to RDP into my system, but I forgot that I turned it off at the end of the day. You know, maybe that's a support call, a hands-on call, or maybe I just don't have any options. Well, I can't do my work. That's no good. Um, so long story short here, please, please, please don't be exposing 3389 through your firewalls, right? That's, that's a no-no. Um, let's look at some different options. Now, obviously, uh, as Gabe mentioned before, one of the most common deployments is putting a VPN connection in front of that. Now, that does a lot of good things, right? You log into the VPN and there, hey, there you can do some, some multi-factor auth stuff. And then you log into your RDP. Now, hopefully here you can kind of see the problem. Uh, the first is that that's a two-step process, right? I have to know where I'm connecting. I have to know my credentials. And I have to know uh, that once I get connected, I need to stay connected. And if I disconnect, well, I ain't got to go through this whole process again. So it's not the prettiest thing in the world. So... There, this is really kind of a choppy way of, of doing that. And obviously there's, there's a better way to do things. So what I wanted to talk about is that remote protocol itself. Obviously RDP, um, 
there's great use cases for it, but they're kind of limited and trying to do things outside of that limited use case, like, you know, administrator access or, or things like that. That's when RDP kind of falls down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ICA and HDX. Um, and there's a lot of things here. There's continued investment. As Gabe said, we've been doing it for a really long time and there's a lot of performance and capability. But traditionally, ICA and HDX has been related to uh, virtual apps and virtual desktops and or, you know, Zen apps and desktop as it was formerly known. But the remote PC use case is the whole thing that we've been talking about that gets rid of the requirement for VPN and then connect to RDP and do all that sort of thing that gives you all the great benefits of ICA and HDX, things like the security, like the multi-factor, like the better performance across the WAN, uh, significantly more so, right, then you don't have to worry about a VPN connection than the RDP connection. Plus, you get all the bonuses of HDX, like uh, the WAN efficiency, integration with SD-WAN, the watermarking, anti-screen capture security uh, features that have recently come out. So you're getting that full experience, and the use case that you're fulfilling is, is kind of unique, and hopefully it makes it that much better for the users, because all of those security policies that we talked about with VPNs, you don't have to worry about because you're already you've already got those policies in place for their workstation. Now you're getting them a full fidelity and high efficiency experience uh, from the outside. So to talk about that a little bit more, uh, I wanted to hand over to Joshua because he has very recently been through this and hopefully he can talk some more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand this over to Joshua. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Joshua Sundquist. As uh, mentioned, let me just pull up my slides. There we go, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. Looks great. Awesome. All right, so my name is Joshua Sundquist. Um, I was uh, asked to come and, and speak with everyone today um, as a customer. Uh, I only joined Citrix a few months back. Uh, prior to that, I worked on Wall Street in uh, the big financial enterprise firms for about 20 years. And my experience with remote PC kind of goes back to the beginning, uh, hence the name of this slide. Um, the scenario that I'll talk through today started off uh, more than several years ago. Uh, the environment was running Zen Desktop 5, uh, you know, if you want to put a time frame on it. Uh, total endpoints were about 140,000. Uh, of those, about 40,000 were virtuals, VDIs, and uh, the others were uh, about 100,000 physical devices. Um, and for the time that we were doing that, those were high numbers. You know, to give everyone some context and some, some history, the company had decided uh, that they were going to go all in on uh, on Zen Desktop and VDI, and at the time they were even considering uh, going with uh, VDI for all users, regardless of the use case. Obviously, that that changed over time because as most of us in the Citrix space know, there's there's great use cases for everything, but generally applying the one use case to everyone um, doesn't always make sense, which left us in the position where we had the mixed environment. We had uh, a big chunk of VDI machines, but a bigger chunk of physical machines. Um, at the time, the connectivity model was going through a third-party uh, gateway appliance that used an ActiveX uh, control as the RDP agent. It actually worked you know, pretty well, but I'm sure as most people know, what happened to ActiveX, um, Microsoft killed it, and the company uh, that made the appliance didn't have uh, a replacement that didn't require jumping through a lot of hoops. So suddenly we were in a position where we needed to come up with uh, an alternative and quick. Uh, obviously anyone who was using Zen Desktop was able to connect beautifully and seamlessly um, through web interface at the time, but anyone who was connecting to physical needed uh, to find a way as well. Uh, our workaround at the time, because it was needed quick and uh, relatively painlessly was to publish RDP as a Zen app application. Um, it did work, generally speaking, covered a lot of use cases. It allowed people to connect to their physicals. Um, and I'll go through some of the, the specifics. You know, we did have some issues that came uh, with that setup because we were double hopping using 
the two protocols that Jake mentioned. Um, <clears throat> users with anything other than basic home setups, you know, just, you know, they had their machine with, with one monitor at home, they tended to work okay. Um, people who had things like mixed resolution setups weren't great. Apple users in particular, a lot of them like to have their Apple laptop with an external display, which is two different resolutions, um, and they didn't work very well. Um, and around that time, people started vocally saying to us things along the lines of, well, why can't we have the Zen desktop experience when we connect to our physicals? Um, we didn't have a good answer to them, so we, we went to Citrix and said, you know, can you please, please, please consider uh, making a VDA that we can use on physical desktops? Um, there were some other issues that came along with that as well. For example, publishing RDP to accommodate these tens and tens and tens of thousands of users um, meant that we were also carrying over 700 uh, ZenApp servers dedicated to doing nothing other than hosting published RDP. Um, that was for primary servers as well as, you know, HA and DR capabilities. Um, so the problem that we were trying to solve as an engineering slash architecture team, we had to provide remote access to physical desktops. That's a given. Um, we had to have data, le data leakage prevention controls. Uh, so for anyone who works in highly regulated industries like finance and healthcare or government, um, military, uh, you know, that it's just not an option um, to not have those controls in place. And ideally, you don't want the controls to be too heavy handed. Um, situations where you either have to just turn something on across the board or off across the board usually aren't great because it means you end up turning off a lot more than, than you really required to. Um, an issue that we had was native RDP DLP controls were mostly either on or off with not much flexibility. So if you want a clipboard, you could turn it on or you could turn it off, um, but you couldn't do anything granular with it. As far as I want it on in these situations and off in those situations, or I want to be able to paste into the session but not out of the session. Um, we also needed different DLP control behavior depending on the user, whether the user was on-prem or remote. So, for example, if the user was just connecting from one company office to a different company office to a desktop there, we wanted them to be able to copy and paste and use client drive mapping and all the other um, goodies that the virtual channels bring us. Um, but if they were connecting remotely from offsite, from a, a Starbucks or um, from home, we needed to be able to turn those things off. Um, and we also needed to be able to apply different controls to different sets of users in different uh, geographical areas. For example, we found out there was uh, a legal requirement in Switzerland that the users there could only print from company offices and they should never be allowed to print from anywhere outside of company offices. So we had to solve for that, but that scenario also only applied to users in Switzerland. Uh, when you get into these complex scenarios, you really need something with really robust and flexible policies and a lot of times native RDP just didn't have it. So here's our original solution, published RDP. It did technically solve our requirements. It gave us the DLP controls um, on the, you know, ICA stack. Um, failed pretty miserably on the RDP stack, but we had our work around. Uh, it was a horrible user experience with mixed resolution scenarios. As I said, when you had uh, Apple Mac uh, laptop users with an external display and they would try to connect, usually what would happen is the RDP session would choose one of the resolutions, either the smaller laptop screen or the bigger external screen, and it would set the entire session on both screens to that resolution, which either resulted in what we called the scroll bars of doom, where your, your resolution was so um, big on the, the screens that you just had these endless scroll bars, or it was the opposite <clears throat> where the, the resolution was so high that on your small laptop screen, you could barely read any of the text. And so it, it was a really bad scenario. We didn't have a solution for it other than to tell users, well, pick a screen, either use your laptop screen or use your external display, but not both. And they kind of looked at us like, really, that's your answer? Um, we also had a lot of complaints around choppy, unreliable mouse and keyboard response, you know, the old you type five lines of text and then you watch the ghost on the screen start to fill it in a few seconds after you've typed it. Poor multimedia experience. <clears throat> Again, anyone who, who works in a highly regulated environment, you have to do tons and tons and tons of compliance training, which are usually these, you know, fun videos that you get to watch and video when you're double hopping an RDP session through an ICA session just wasn't great uh, to be polite. 
um, and different user connection workflow depending on if they're connecting to a physical over RDP or directly to a virtual using ICA. If you're connecting to your Zen desktop, you just go and click your, your computer and off you go. If you're connecting to a physical, you would have to launch the RDP client, wait for that to load, then know what your machine name was, type it in and then connect to it, <clears throat> and trying to explain to users why they had to do two different things depending on what type of machine they were connecting to, again, wasn't a great scenario. Um, then you get into the technical side of it. It's greater administrator overhead. You're dealing with multiple different management consoles, one to manage the RDP direct connections, one to manage the ICA connections. You have different sets of policies to control um, the session behavior. Um, you're dealing with help desk complexity. When a user calls in saying, I'm having a problem working remotely, the first thing a help desk um, person has to do is spend time trying to figure out, okay, are they trying to connect in via RDP or via ICA while the user was saying, like, I don't get it. Why are you wasting my time with this? We haven't even started trying to troubleshoot my issue. Um, hence, we get into um, remote PC. Um, Gabe and, and you know, the talented folks at Citrix uh, answered our prayers and said, hey, we've got a VDA uh, coming around for physical. Uh, do you want to give it a try? And we said, yes, please. Um, the reason I'm showing this architecture on the screen is to really just highlight the fact that remote desktop, um, or what we always call uh, VDA on physical, um, doesn't require you to change your environment at all. This was, you know, a, a typical um, architecture for fully on-prem environment, which is the one that we were working in. This is just your classic Zen desktop, um, or now, you know, virtual desktop environment and you just load up your VDAs, you point to your existing controllers, and you don't have to do anything different. Um, life is pretty sweet and pretty good. Obviously, as your environment grows, you may want to add more sites, um, et cetera, but you don't have to make any significant changes to your infrastructure to start using this today, which is another thing that made it really attractive for us. Um, so getting into the remote PC access solution, it did fully solve all of our requirements and added several benefits. On the IT side, it gave us those <clears throat> flexible data leakage prevention controls that allowed us to lock down only what was needed. And again, anyone who's lived with you know, a re highly regulated um, IT scenario, you can't allow certain types of data to go out, but you can allow certain types of data to come in. Having the ability to really granularly just go and flip the switches that we had to while leaving all the other capabilities um, open and available for users, made users' lives easier, and then it made IT's lives easier. Um, again, one set of policies to manage across all your all of our desktops by just standardizing on using ICA as our protocol, as our remote access protocol, uh, regardless of whether you're connecting to physical or virtual, allowed us to go and set up our policies in one place and be done, rather than trying to figure out how to get the same policy results into different um, protocol environments. Uh, also, one set of management tools and consoles, no having to deal with having, you know, an uh, RDP management console open on one side and uh, and your, you know, Citrix management consoles on the other. Uh, one set of management tools uh, as well. Help desk simplification, no need to spend time determining what type of machine a user is trying to connect to. They're all trying to connect the same way and you can just jump right into solving the problem. Um, another you know, unexpected benefit for us was you, uh, extending your Citrix Analytics capabilities uh, because it looks into the ICA uh, connections and can tell you what's going on and where things aren't going well. Um, by connecting over ICA to all of our uh, desktops, regardless of whether they were physical or virtual, extended those analytic capabilities into our entire uh, footprint. From a user perspective, uh, it gave, gives users a great experience, even with complex setups like mixed resolution displays. What's funny is <clears throat> when we first brought in um, what, again, we called VDN physical remote PC, we originally were only targeting um, users with known bad scenarios. So someone like with their uh, Apple laptop with an external display, we offered this to them as, as the solution. Word started to spread among the user uh, community that this thing was the greatest thing since sliced bread when you're working remotely because it, it gives you that in-person experience even though you're working remotely. And as it started to gain the positive reputation, 
people started coming to us and saying, can I have a uh, remote PC? They weren't calling it that, but we knew what it was. And we said, well, why do you have this, you know, mixed resolution scenario? Do you have any of these known bad scenarios? And they said, no, but I saw uh, Jill using it and, you know, it's awesome. And I want that because when I work from home, I've got mouse lag and, and everything else. And so people, users actually started calling um, our service desk and asking to be set up on it. Eventually, we came to the conclusion that it just made sense to deploy the VDA on all of our machines uh, by default um, because, A, we already had the licensing in place because our entire enterprise was using various Citrix products for, for, for different reasons. And, you know, the benefits were, were so great that it was worth um, going through the, the process. Um, other benefits for users, which again, you're comparing it to them connecting over, you know, either a published RDP or RDP over a VPN. HDX gives you that rich audio, video, multimedia. Watching those compliance training videos is suddenly, you know, a bit less painful, at least from a, a technology perspective. Um, even if they're connecting over a less than, than ideal network. Um, I mean, a uh, prime example, I've been staying in a lot of hotels lately uh, related to work and they give you that, you know, bottom tier, uh, not very fast connection. And I've been, you know, having to take those same compliance videos having started at Citrix and uh, and it just works over HDX, um, over, over, you know, native RDP, just not so great. Um, the real-time optimization pack for Skype uh, that stacks on top of your uh, ICA session gives you uh, top quality video and audio calls uh, as if you're in the office. And that's been something that's been a lot of fun too, is working remotely and making a Skype call to colleagues of mine and them having to ask me, you know, are you remote today? Because I don't see it at your desk, but it sounds like you're you're in the office. So that's always, you know, awesome. Um, going along with it, another benefit was we scripted uh, power on, off, and restart capabilities into the user uh, portal uh, using Wake on LAN links so the user could self-service their VDI restarts, and that includes physical and virtual. So it's, again, one of those cases of if your desktop went to sleep, if your desktop got shut down over the weekend, you don't have to call your office mate and ask them if they can walk over and push the button on your PC. Um, we were able to do it through Wake on Land, and the users can do it right through the web interface. Um, I mean, I'm sure that we've all also had the scenarios where um, your session gets hung, and now what do you do? I've got to call the help desk and and you know ask them to remote into my machine and and manually kick it. Um, users can do it themselves now, and it just makes it so much easier for them. Um, also, the same user experience, uh, regardless of whether they're connecting to a physical or virtual, uh, gone is the headache of trying to explain to the user, well, you have a physical desktop that's your primary machine, so you have to write down your machine name and you have to go take these extra steps in order to connect versus the um, then desktop experience, which is just click on the machine, off you go. Now they all connect the same way regardless. So. As you can see, um, hopefully it wasn't you know firing through there too quickly, um, but this is a real world scenario. It's not marketing fluff. I can tell you this as, as a Citrix uh, customer um, and it really did solve our issues and then made our lives on the IT side dramatically easier. Users loved it and we all know that that's a pretty rare combination uh, where you know IT is able to put something in that makes their own lives easier and that users uh, really love as well. Um, so there it is. Feel free to you know hit me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever else you like to and I'm, I'm happy to talk through any scenario um, I can help with because like I said at this point in my mind I'm still more more customer than anything and, and I still think like a customer. Um, so that's it. And once we got that together and we were able to unify that whole remote access experience, that brought us to, you know, considering what else uh, we could unify and, and how we could get even more value from uh, our Citrix products, uh, which I will hand over to Monica to talk about that. Perfect. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, so I hope you all can see my screen. My name is Monica Grismer and I am a product marketing specialist here at Citrix specifically um, in the workspace realm, but then also for virtualization. So as Josh was just very eloquently stating, remote PC access is a great solution for user experience, and it gives your users seamless and optimized access to their desktops and all of the resources they need. 
But getting started with remote PC access also gives you a great opportunity to maximize other Citrix offerings for your users. So every company most definitely has dynamic, varying use cases and different capabilities of our offerings may be right for some of your users. So I'd like to tell you a little bit more today about how not only can you use remote PC access to get introduced to more Citrix offerings, but it can also get you started with heading to the workspace. So a great place to get your foot in the door with Citrix is through our content collaboration. It's a tool for both on-prem and service customers to securely share and collaborate on their files. Um, I hope many of you are familiar with it, but as your user needs grow, we definitely wanna find new ways to keep your employees productive. So your Citrix content collaboration may currently aggregate just files, which is the screenshot on the left. And when integrated with Citrix workspace offerings, your files are aggregated alongside all of your other resources for easy access. Something else that I love about our workspace offering and collaboration tools is that your users can access all of their data, doesn't matter where it's located, um, even if they're using OneDrive, Dropbox, SharePoint, um, on-prem stores, cloud stores, it doesn't matter. They can access their files all from one unified location. Another great offering that we have is Citrix Access Control. So you may have gotten started with remote PC access and introduced some file sharing into your environment, but you probably have a lot of users who are utilizing web and SaaS-based applications. So admins can deploy these applications securely with our access control capabilities. So this helps consolidate um, HDX proxy, single sign-on and web filtering to all of these applications. Also with our cloud app control, admins can enhance security as well as centrally manage their policies to display watermarks, restrict downloads, restrict printing from these sessions, say which specific websites they want individuals to not be able to access. Just as Jake was speaking earlier about the functionalities that are within remote PC to do these things, you can also do this with your web and SaaS with access control. Additionally, something exciting is that access control for storefront is currently in tech preview to be GA'd soon. So I talked a little bit about the workspace, but as you're making your journey there, I know everyone is in different phases of their journey. After you've incorporated files, web, SaaS, you can introduce your enterprise applications as well as desktops, and we call it one single pane of glass of the Citrix workspace itself. So you can also deploy your remote PC access desktop within the workspace interface alongside all of your other apps and files. So this single location is definitely great for your users who are using, there's a, a tablet shown here, maybe they're using mobile devices, PCs, Macs, it doesn't matter, they get one unified workspace. So that's definitely something that we're very proud of as Citrix and is what, we're, what we love as one common platform. But to that regard, a great thing about this unified experience is that we also introduce the choice of multi-cloud environments. So for both potentially on-prem to cloud hybrid environments or multi-cloud deployments, they're all optimized by Citrix technologies and can leverage our HDX technologies and different protocols. So admins are given the choice of cloud platforms and deployment scenarios that work best for them. So you can see all of the platforms that we support, which we've been supporting for a long time now, but in addition to these, we will also soon be supporting VMware Cloud on Amazon Web Services and also the new Windows Virtual Desktops offering from Azure. So that introduces even more cloud and deployment choices, whatever works best for your respective environments. And something else, if you all were able to attend or tune into Synergy, really big is that our workspace intelligent features are where you can eventually move your workspace to. So this is where we're headed. This is just a de design concept as of now. Just wanted to give you all a little bit more insight into the future of our tech. So firstly, we wanted to point out the search functionalities. So Within the Citrix workspace, you'll not only be able to aggregate your files, web, 
web and SaaS apps, published apps, desktops, but also there will be a feed. So there's a lot of content within your workspace itself. So there will be a search functionality to be able to easily find items that you're specifically looking for. So the newest part of the intelligent features that we're introducing are the feed capabilities. So that is where our micro app builders come into play. So you create micro apps out of the applications and desktops you're already using so that we can pull um, different notifications and tasks into the resource feed so that your users can have a linear process of how to get work done. So this is not only a place for everyone to have a launching point to access their web, SaaS, all of their resources, but to actually do their work and be even more productive to help your company out. And then lastly, like I said before, your apps and desktops are still there, still aggregated, and your files are still um, in line with all of your other resources. So very exciting. Just wanted to give you a little bit more insight into where we're heading and where you can look forward to your Citrix deployments running off to in the future. So that was a very high level overview of everything that you can do with, well, actually just a few things that you can do with Citrix solutions in addition to your remote PC offerings. So once you get your foot in the door with remote PC and the following capabilities, that's just the beginning. Solving your use cases with Citrix technologies can get you acclimated with our capabilities and jumpstart your move into the greater Citrix workspace. So now that you've seen how getting started with remote PC access can accelerate your journey to workspace, I'm gonna turn it back over to Gabe for some key takeaways. Great, thank you, Monica. Thank you, team, I appreciate it. Um, great uh, segments uh, as usual. And uh, wait for the screen to switch over here. Okay. Great, thank, thank you so much, Monica. So some of the key takeaways that you learned over the, the last 45 minutes uh, is that, you know, we want to present to you a solution that reduces frustrations that users may have that you don't know about with remote access to existing PCs. Enable that flexible work style over any device and any connection. Um, reduce your time spent, you know, managing the PCs and from a patching perspective or the overhead of making sure they're all up to date uh, to a certain extent. Uh, gain more value if you have uh, existing uh, licenses, perhaps thinking about new ways where you can consume them or help your customers consume them. Um, and being able to unify the analytics, insights, and security postures from a single integrated solution without having to think about what type of solution is deployed to which user community. And then starting from that strategic use case, that one thing that you're thinking about solving and migrating to your workspace of the future. And we hope that you know, every one of these sections will, will help you think or um, you know, look towards the future and not just leaving behind maybe a single um, de deployment offering. So from a deployment architecture viewpoint, um, it's very simple as you can see here. Uh, with you, when you introduce the Citrus Cloud Service and the Gateway Service, you effectively can become infrastructureless. So a lot of the times we talk about the on-prem solutions. This is also mix and match. So you can add networking appliances to your gateways, to your, um, to your cloud services, and vice versa. So there's totally flexible uh, deployment models. Uh, we're bringing all these great technologies to you within this simple architecture. Just a reminder, protection from key logging, screen capture, uh, being able to watermark that stuff that session without having to buy other third-party, third-party solutions. So all that comes baked in with the, with the product solution. And we just released a reference architecture for remote PC access. And we just also had a, a master class on having uh, to, to think about how you can solve uh, the physical dilemma, if you will, with PCs, with Citrix solutions. And then a whole, whole other uh, supplemental resource um, that you can you know, either view demo videos or you know, kind of some read of some of our blogs. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. Um, if there are any, um, that appreciate your time today. Um, yeah, so we're, we're concluded with our segment here. 
Hey, Gabe. Uh, quick, quick, quick. There were actually two that came in pretty similar. Can you elaborate on licensing? Uh, for example, what, what license is required to get the remote PC capability? Yeah, so actually, that's funny. I had a slide in here and I chose to delete it on that. Um, so, from a licensing perspective, and Monica, you can uh, keep me honest here. From a cloud perspective, it's in the virtual apps and desktop service and our works workspace suite licensing from a perpetual or on-prem type uh, it's in the our premium and premium plus Monica she may have stepped away but it's 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 basically in a, our our top level um, entitlements right sorry I couldn't go Make off mute final. Gabe um, <laughs> it's in perpetual advanced and premium is the the new names Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Gabe, one other question, um, pretty technically specific, but uh, I, I, I think we're in the, on the right track. I did respond, but uh, it was a good question around, you know, obviously with remote PC, you're connecting to a desktop OS computer. You know, what happens when you have multiple users, maybe like on, a, on different shifts, like day shift, night shift, that are going to use the same machine? Um, can you elaborate a little bit there? It looks like um, it just shows as unavailable to them. I assume that's correct. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. And maybe also Joshua can throw out a little clarity from a real world experience. But the way it's architected is that it's single user, single OS. Um, and so it's not, it's not anywhere near the multi-user uh, experience. So if a single user is accessing it and another user wants to connect, you can set up a kind of a, an, an authority um, um, uh, instance where the remote user can make the request to the local user and the local user will see that request. Um, that is done through um, a, a registry key that's on our, our Citrix documentation work, uh, or excuse me, Citrix documentation website. And then, um, you know, if the users are still logged or disconnected and another user attempts to log in, they won't be able to connect because um, we see that another user is logged in. So that it was primarily built for single user, single OS use cases. Uh, but if you'd like to, to see it work in broader use cases like that for more functionality, uh, you know, contact the Citrix sales representatives. Great. Uh, I think we're all set as far as questions go. Uh, Gabe, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. I think we hand it back to you. Is that right? Yeah, I just have a couple of links I'm going to throw in the chat window for everyone. And then I have um, a couple of events I want to tell you all about. So pull that screen up right now. And there you go. Okay. So um, just want to thank you all for being with us today. Really appreciate everyone's time and um, let you know about a couple of events um, coming up. So the Citrix Future of Work Tour that was uh, mentioned earlier, I believe, the virtual edition of that is coming up in August and CGC will have a booth there. So we'd love to have you stop by and say hello. Um, and we also have two of our Excel events coming up, one in the Midwest and one in the Great Lakes. Uh, in September. So if you guys are anywhere near those cities, Cincinnati or Milwaukee, definitely check those out. You'll see in the chat window, there's a link to our events calendar. You can get everything that you need to know about the virtual uh, future of work tour, as well as the Excel events and um, all of our other local events and upcoming webinars uh, on that calendar. So please check it out. And then also in the chat window, you will see a link to a survey. It's short. It's anonymous. We just like to get your feedback on all of our webinars. Love to see what you think. If there are any areas we can improve, if you have suggestions for future topics, send us, send us all your feedback. We love to get it. And finally, hope that you will follow us on Twitter at MyCUGC. It's the best way to keep up to date with everything that's going on with CUGC, with our local events, our webinars, our blogs. We have lots of stuff. Um, on Twitter and then everything on the website. We tweet about it all the time. So definitely follow us if you wanna stay up to date. 
Um, and that is it for me. Um, I want to thank everyone again, Gabe, Joshua, Monica, and Jake. Thanks so much for being with us today. And thank you all you attendees for spending an hour of your day with us. And I hope thank you that, so much, uh, Stephanie. It was a pleasure. Thanks, all. All right. Well, I hope to have you guys back on another webinar again soon, and we'll look for everyone um, online at mycgc.org. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.